Riot Games has filed motions that aim to force two employees involved in an ongoing lawsuit against the company in tour private arbitration. A move the company's attorney tells Kit Apu is in line with clauses in the employees' employment contracts. The motions spotted by Kotaku are the latest development in a duo of lawsuits filed against Riot Games within the past six months by past and current employees that accused the company of facilitating gender-based discrimination. The lawsuits themselves followed a Kotaku story from last year on what several developers from the studio called a toxic workplace environment that resulted in female employees enduring discrimination and harassment. The attorney representing Riot Games says that the two employees being targeted by the private arbitration motions both agreed to arbitration clauses in the employment contracts. According to the attorney, those clauses dictate that employees must take complaints like the ones raised in the existing lawsuits into private arbitration rather than to a trial. The lawyer representing the employees meanwhile said in a press release that those motions only serve to silence the voices of individuals who speak out against such misconduct. Slime Rancher led developer Nick Popovich shares advice on how to effectively prototype a game. Speaking during a recent Ghana Sutra Twitch stream, Slime Rancher led developer Nick Popovich shared how the team at Manome Park went about prototyping Slime Rancher and elaborated on how a productive prototyping process can be a vital tool to nail down exactly what makes a game fun to play. The cue, he says, is boiling the game down to its most basic elements and using the prototyping stage to make sure those car concepts function well without the support of miscellaneous mechanics and features. Anyone who's making a game, if you are really honest, there's one series of things that a player is doing every two minutes for 90% of the experience. While Popovich notes that there are a few exceptions to that rule, he affirms that most games contain this car loop. In Slime Rancher, you are running around and you are axing stuff. You are putting it back in a cordial. And you are sorting things. You are sort of managing chaos in that environment. He explains. That was like the first thing that we ironed out. We made sure that felt good. The rest of the game was just built around that foundation. Popovich says that this concept is what the team kept in mind as they progressed through the prototyping stage. He says they built the prototype as a whole game, complete with a mock game world that locked down that car loop and added just enough polish. The team handed out that prototype to friends first, asking them to treat it like a final product, and later to strangers with the light fit that the prototype was actually a final product, just to solicit feedback on that car. Two minute loop. What they found was that testers enjoyed playing the game in that secretly early state, despite having complaints about the rough art and lack of polish. I think if you are making a prototype for your game and your feedback from your testers is that it is not quite there, and you have to tell them, well please just imagine that there are. Also there's other systems that will inform what it is that you are doing, and there will be this part to it, and crafting, and all this other stuff, there is not working, says Popovich. Either make those things and prove it first, before you actually start developing the game, or keep stripping that game down until you are truly honest with yourself, and all you are left with is that two minute loop. Every game has one. Whether that two-minute loop is more real jumping from platform to platform, or jumping through portals in portal, Popovich maintains that good prototype can be the key to perfecting the car mechanic of a game.
The clip above captures more of his prototyping experience and game development advice. Meanwhile, the full live streamed Slime Rancher interview, as well as it and of other developer chats, can be found over on the Gamma Sutra Twitch channel, an essential element of video games, and by extension any game, is having a win on the lost state. One aspect we have seen to add more weight to a game's design is the use of punishment systems, systems that penalize the player beyond the initial lost state. However, we are going to talk about why kicking the player when they are down is not the best way to motivate them to keep playing. The core concept of a punishment system is taking the lost state and extending it. In most games, when the player has a lost state, typically running out of health, a dying the character, and the world around them return to a neutral state, when you play a platformer and you die after a checkpoint, the world resets and the player returns to the last checkpoint reached. In this regard, there is a lost state, but its impact does not extend beyond the loss. The earliest example of a punishment system would be the use of leaves. In many classic games, when the player runs out of leaves, playing another game, they can be sent back to the start of a level, or even back to the start of the entire game. Many schmucks have featured punishment systems, where the player loses power-ups and upgrades each time they die, and this presents some major point about punishment systems. They leave the player worse off than they were before the system activated. This feeling of being worse off can present itself in two ways. The player is now weaker and has a greater chance to die again. Or the player has permanently lost progress. They made and must now do things again. The recent example of my issues with punishment systems came with Sick Hero Shadows device. In previous from software games, there was a punishment system in how if you died, your accumulated souls, which are experience and currency in the game, would fall to the ground. If you did not get back to pick them up again, before you died a second time, then they would be lost forever. While this was extreme, it did give skilled players a pretty fair chance to recover their resources and they could keep trying bosses and pick them back up at the same time. Seeking Rose system is different and is called Drag Lot. Unlike in the Souls on titles, you have at the foot a 30% chance to recover money and experience points when you die. Die too many times and the Drag Lot system kicks in causing NPCs in the world to get sick. While they are sick, their quest lines will not be able to move forward, and your recovery chance drops down. The Dragon Rot system represents the worst aspects of punishment systems in video games. First, the system itself has no bearings or impact on expert players. Once you get good enough at the game, you will never experience Dragon Rot. The system offers no greater depth or choices to the player but simply causes progress loss. The game does allow players to bank their money by buying coin purses, but it requires the player to return to a merchant each time they want to do it, causing time spent away from progress. The biggest issue and the reason why these systems are not good design is that they cause further problems for people who are already feeling the loss about failing to begin with. Even casual games these days have backed away from punishment systems, and now, just to give players infinite lives to play through, taking away the player's hard-earned progress can be a kick in the gut. But I am sure some of you are about to ask this, what about roguelikes? Roguelikes, despite having extreme punishments for losing, get away with the systems. Roguelike design has always been built on punishment systems. When you die, all progress is immediately wiped no matter where you are in the game. That certainly is more damaging than just losing a few resources or power-ups. So why are gamers fine with it? 
The reason has to do with the design of roguelikes, and how they are built to be replayable. When you fail in a linear game, the challenges and the situations remain fixed. Losing progress means that you have to repeat content that you have already done until you get past your roadblock. In a roguelike, however, every playthrough is ideally procedurally generated to be something original. Having to restart a roguelike gives the player a brand new experience to play. The fact that you never know what to expect with each playthrough gives the genre its high replayability. And that's the key point. You are supposed to replay a roguelike and have new experiences and content. You are not supposed to replay a linear game by banging your head against a wall until you give up or get past a section as a quick tangent. This is often why having fixed situations in roguelike design is not seen as favorable for the genre. If the player always knows that X is going to happen.